My name's Louise Burns, and I'm sales and administration. And I started uh, not in a full-time capacity, but in 1991, when the station was in the basement of the Shatner building. My position is um, sales, but for me, advertising is like a direct way of community outreach. It's what we do is we like partner with all the kind of emerging local bands and the festivals that are happening in the city and all the kind of community grassroots initiatives and the activist events. So I really see it as a way of uh, the station connecting to the greater Montreal area and um, all the like-minded initiatives that are going on there. It's exciting because it means um, I keep myself <laughs> and the station as connected as possible to uh, the endless amount of things that are going on in the city and it's the place that pulls the university uh, campus in and pulls the Montreal, you know, it's sort of like a bridge between campus life and the greater Montreal area. On a personal level, I was a single parent um, that uh, needed a job. <laughs> Well, had been involved in community radio, had been involved in um, the, the traditional music industry, uh, working at a record label, and uh, so very like attracted to uh, sound and music and uh, communication. And so I came to the station on a grant and a like a getting single parents back to the workplace kind of grant, and was willing to do whatever needed to be done, and. Uh, had no vision of myself as a salesperson. <laughs> like, it was just not, at, or as a businessy person. And saw so much creative energy and so many people involved in the kind of like content creating, uh, you know, wacky ideas creating, and knew that the place needed uh, like a backbone, <laughs> you know, that. Uh, kept the finances in, uh, in place and, and basically laid a solid foundation for everybody to leap off of, you know. Very new, um, you know, just in terms of establishing boundaries and people's levels of comfort and all the social norms that we are used to. But um, our production person basically came in and said, we're shutting down on the 16th. And I have to say that largely I did it in uh, solidarity with them. <laughs> because I personally was not at an informed place where I would understood that this was actually what we needed to do. And I, of course, thought, you know, in a week we'll be back. But then the gradual realization that everything we have to do is going to be, we're going to have to change, is, uh, was quite something. And um, technically, we just adapted to new like airtime, this program that we use very rapidly. We kind of had a lot of archives, like our, our program can be archived on our web, website. So we rebroadcast, we had a moment of rebroadcasting, but very quickly people adapted to doing it at home. We wrote a whole bunch of grants that were available that allowed us to get the equipment to set people up. And it has sort of mushroomed into now like interesting capacities that we didn't conceive of before where um, we are, you know, able to have satellite studios in different, all sorts of community centers or people's basements or, you know, where um, the kind of like safety protocols can be much easier uh, maintained, like in a radio station, especially this radio station, corridor mandate is, is to be accessible and open. And that means, you know, guests. It means, um, you know, kids. It means grandparents. It means, you know, every. You need that fluidity. Like there's tons of people who go through this station. We miss the community part, obviously. It's not the same. <laughs> like lots of zooming and lots of training over digital platforms, you know, and uh, you know, but it's not tactile quite the same. And, but we never went off air, which is kind of incredible, wow. considering it's 24 seven, 365 days a year, so. Um, well, when we turned 30, <laughs> I dug into our history 
And part of that was to explore the evolution of the medium, right, of radio. And, and uh, one of the things that's interesting is that we uh, went beyond 87 and went into the old yearbooks and sort of took all these photos and we saw how like initially, um, even Radio McGill was like, it, radio was like a science experiment, how to get sound from one place to another. And then suddenly you see pictures where everybody's wearing army uniforms and you realize the military started using the radio. Then in the 60s, you see uh, like uh, newsrooms with uh, people wearing suit and ties and reel-to-reel -reel machines. And you can see that the, what the Radio McGill was to like imitate commercial media. And then in the 70s, suddenly you see like everybody long hair and you, you can see that they the full albums are, and you can see that it's become what we now sort of know as like this underground kind of uh, community radio, campus community radio. And then, you know, then we get our license and it is um, a, a real um, mixture of many different uh, things that are missing from the commercial radio. So you have like a lot of hip hop, you have a lot of community radio, like different cultural communities who do their own programming. You have a lot of the like local underground uh, music scene in all its forms, which are many, <laughs> like there's so many right now. What we, like the immediacy is changing. It's still immediate because most of the time it's live, but people are listening in very different ways now. They, they, there's a lot more, um, you know, appointment listening, which is what they call like if your your favorite show, you download and so you listen to it whenever you want to. And so that changed in terms of like ticket giveaways or the weather or things like that because people are not maybe not listening right at that moment, but. The radio is still really tied to car culture, which is interesting too. Um, a lot, the thing that differentiates it from like Spotify or other platforms that people are listening to audio is one is that there's of course a presentation of it. And then two is that as a somebody who's doing radio, you get a lot of random people because of that kind of, you know, um, just, searching around on the dial. The benefit of radio is that kind of random, you know, I just discovered you person. I think like the podcasting is so exciting and uh, a lot of stuff that is uh, we create as a podcast or, or even understanding, okay, is this a radio show or is this a podcast? Podcasts allow for like, uh, okay, I'm going to tell this story and it's going to be 12 episodes, you know, or something like that, like a long form documentary is what we used to call it. But it, and now I'm listening to the way um, they sound and uh, getting out there and trying to uh, do that. Like, so some of that is in, uh, an in-studio sound, but some of it is atmospheric sound um, is really uh, the push for the next, for the, for this medium, in some ways, is to like really dive into that and uh, you know use radio as one means of distributing. The, the intention is always to sort of really re reflect something of our times, right? So, you know, as I was going back into the real history, if like we listen to a piece of audio right now from the 1960s, we know it was from the 1960s, like the the vernacular, the tone of voice, like we've, like it, it, it changes, it, which is really interesting. And so does, so does like what we consider to be um, like a really, uh, you know, popular sound in music has, has clearly evolved over the years. So, you know, our intention is to be like right there with that and to, um, I mean, to, to like, to change with it, and but also to be knowledgeable of the past. And there's a lot of uh, like a precarious, you know, there, because there's not huge financing uh, or a huge infrastructure to support it. So there's always that sense of like struggle. <laughs> and uh, also, um, you know, just in terms of what we cover politically, um, 
in terms of our neighborhoods and our, our uh, reporting, we're often dealing with people who are pushing back against, you know, uh, policies that they don't feel are uh, benefiting them. So there's that kind of uh, voice. It's, uh, sometimes, it, like when I did that time capsule and listening to some of the, you know, interviews in the 90s or whatever, and you're going, oh my God, we're still struggling with the same issues, you know, it's quite kind of frightening. But then there's other points where you say, okay, no, there's, things have changed. So. Now, because of COVID, we're, we're really digging through our archives again. And so there's more, and there seems to be a lot of interest in uh, reflecting, you know, and, and sort of saying, okay, what were we doing for the past 30 years? What did we sound like and how did it change? And so we're, we are trying to explore that a little bit more. And, um, but I think for the most part, people are much more about, you know, chasing after some artists that they, really are excited about and want to interview and feature or you know it's much more than now. In spite of COVID and the pandemic um, that we can find a way to keep the door open you know like that's so important to us um, is, is that we really kept the door open for 30 plus years and so many different people uh, participated and uh, that is kind of really essential. So I hope that, uh, you know, from McGill students that they first don't find it intimidating. I mean, it's okay to be a little intimidating, but not, you know, intimidating to the point of being exciting and challenging, but you know, like, so that there's a, you know, that, that hurdle of getting people in, um, involved, you know, is always a challenge. And it's a, big challenge right now because of not being able to open the doors physically. So anyway, I just hope people explore uh, us and get involved and listen and that's it.